I am the author of Malignant Self Love, Narcissism Revisited. The Revenant, many would say Erzatz Egyptian, Muhammad el Baghdadi, self appointed but self imputed leader of the so called democracy movement in his newly discovered homeland, called last week on the army to commit a putsch against the government. The fawning, cliche ridden, politically correct, navel gazing and effete media in the West did not question this abrupt ideological shift. After all, El Baradai and the protesters in Tahrir Square have always claimed to be upholding Western values, and now they are calling for yet another round of military dictatorship to replace Mubarak's. This definitely is not reminiscent of other people powers revolutions, including the most recent one in Tunisia, which is said to have inspired the tumult in Egypt. The sad truth is that Omar Suleiman, Egypt's much reviled vice president, is 100% right. Egyptians are not ready for a democracy, because they have never had one, and because they are politically immature. Recent trends such as multiculturalism, political correctness, and even crowdsourcing and diversity, all these are perceived as antidotes, counterweights, and forms of protest against the elitism and rationalism that led to the murderous authoritarian ideologies and regimes of the 20th century, to climate changing pollution, and to the nuclear arsenal. So the people now reassert themselves by seizing control of functions hitherto reserved, reserved to the few. This backlash and technology driven revolution are widely equated with the restoration of true democracy. And yet, democracy is not the rule of the people. Democracy is government by periodically vetted representatives of the people. Democracy is not tantamount to a continuous expression of the popular will as it pertains to a range of issues. Functioning and fair democracy is representative, not participatory. Participatory people power is mob rule, also known as oplocracy. It is not democracy. Well, granted, people power is often required in order to establish democracy where it is unprecedented. And revolutions, velvet, rose, orange and jasmine, recently introduced democracy in Eastern Europe and parts of North Africa, for instance. Uh, people power, mass street demonstrations, toppled obnoxious dictatorships from Iran to the Philippines and from Peru to Indonesia. That's all true. But once the institutions of democracy are in place and more or less functional, the people can and must rest. They should let their chosen delegates do the job that they were elected to do. And they must hold their emissaries responsible and accountable in fair and free balance once every two or four or five years. Democracy and the rule of law are bulwarks against the tyranny of the mighty and the privileged elites, but they should not yield a dictatorship of the weak. Heads of state in Latin America, Africa, Asia and East Europe can attest these vital lessons are lost on the dozens of new democracies the world over. Many of these presidents and prime ministers, though democratically elected multiply in some cases, have fallen prey to enraged and vigorous people power movements in their countries. And these breaches of the democratic tradition and process are not the only or most egregious ones. The West boasts of the three waves of democratization that swept across the world since 1975. Yet in the most developing, in most developing countries and nations in transition from communism to capitalism or from dictatorship to, uh, to more representative uh, form of governance, in most of these developing countries, and used to be called third world countries, democracy is an empty word. Granted, the hallmarks of democracy are there. There are parliaments, candidate lists, parties, election propaganda, plurality of media, and even voting. But the quiddity of democracy is absent. The democratic principles and institutions are being consistently hollowed out, undermined, subverted and rendered mock, rendered mock by election fraud, exclusionary policies, cronyism, nepotism, corruption, intimidation of the media and collusion with Western interests, both commercial and political. The new democracies are thinly disguised and criminalized plutocracies. Recall, for instance, the Russian oligarchs. In, in the place of the previous regimes, authoritarian regimes have emerged, for instance, in Central Asia and the Caucasus. 
or puppeteered heterarchies, for instance in Macedonia, Bosnia and Iraq, to mention three recent examples. These new heterarchies, these new democracies, suffer from many of the same ills that afflict their veteran role models. Murky campaign finance, venal revolving doors between state administration and private enterprise, endemic corruption, nepotism and cronyism, self-censoring media, socially, economically and politically excluded minorities, and so on. But while this malaise does not threaten the foundations of the more established democracies, for instance in the United States or France, it does imperil the stability and future of the likes of Ukraine, Serbia, Moldova, Indonesia, Mexico, Macedonia, and Bolivia. Many nations have chosen prosperity over democracy. The denizens of these realms can't speak their mind, can't protest, can't criticize, or can't even joke, lest they be arrested or worse. But in exchange for giving up these freedoms, trivial freedoms in their eyes, they have food on the table, they are fully employed, they receive ample health care and proper education, they save and spend to their heart's content. It's a Faustian deal. In return for all these worldly and intangible goods, Popularity of the leadership, which yields political stability, prosperity, security, prestige abroad, authority at home, a renewed sense of nationalism, collective and community, law and order, and so on and so forth. Or in return for all this package of goods, the citizens of these countries forego the right to be able to criticize the regime or change it every once in a while. Many insist that they have struck a good bargain, not a Faustian deal. Worse still, the West has transformed the ideal of democracy into an ideology at the service of imposing new, a new colonial regime on its former colonies. Spearheaded by the United States, the white and Christian nations of the West embarked with missionary zeal on a transformation willy-nilly of their erstwhile charges into profitable paragons of democracy and good governance. And it's also good for business, of course. And this is not the first time. Napoleon justified his gory campaigns by claiming that they served to spread French ideals throughout a barbarous world. Kipling bemoaned the white man's civilizing burden, referring specifically to Britain's role in India. Hitler believed himself to be the last remaining barrier between the hordes of Bolshevism and the West. <clears throat> the Vatican, by the way, concurred with him. This self-righteousness would have been more tolerable had the West actually meant and practiced what it preached, however self-delusionally. Yet in dozens of cases in the, la in the past 60 years alone, Western countries intervened, often by force of arms, to reverse and nullify the outcomes of perfectly legal and legitimate popular and democratic elections. They did so because of economic and geopolitical interests, and they usually installed rabid dictators in place of the deposed elected functionaries. Remember Chile. The hypocrisy, this hypocrisy, costs the West dearly. Few in the poor and developing world believe that the United States or any of its allies are out to further the causes of democracy, human rights, and global peace. The nations of the West have sown criticism and cynicism, and they are reaping strife and terrorism in return. Moreover, democracy is far from what it is made out to be. Confronted with history, the myth of democracy breaks down. For instance, it is maintained by their chief proponents that democracies are more peaceful than dictatorships. But the two most belligerent, by way of war warfare, most belligerent countries in the world are by, are by a far margin. Israel and the United States, closely followed by the United Kingdom. These are all democracies. And they have started most of the wars, wars in modern history. As of late, China, distinct, distinctly not a democracy, is one of the more tranquil and peaceful polities on the planet. Democracies are said to be inherent, inherently stable, or to successfully incorporate the instability inherent in politics. This, too, is a confabulation. The Weimar Republic gave birth to Adolf Hitler, and Italy had almost 50 governments in as many years. The bloodiest civil wars in history erupted in Republican Spain, and seven decades earlier in, democratic, in a democratic United States. By contrast, Czechoslovakia, <clears throat> a dictatorial communist regime, the USSR and Yugoslavia, imploded upon becoming democratic, having survived intact for more than half a century as tyrannies. Democracies are said to be 
conducive to economic growth, indeed to be a prerequisite for economic growth. But the fastest economic growth rates in history go to Imperial Rome, Nazi Germany, Stalin's USSR, Putin's Russia, post Mao China, and so on. All of them, whatever you think, are not democracies. Granted, democracy allows for the free exchange of information and thus renders markets more efficient and local level bureaucracies less corrupt. This ought to be conducive to economic growth. But who says that the airing of municipal grievances and the exchange of non-political business and economic ideas cannot be achieved in a dictatorship? They are being achieved daily in China. Even in North Korea, only the dear leader is above criticism and reproach. All other levels of government, politicians, civil servants, party hacks and army generals, can and, and do become targets of grassroots criticism and purges. The ruling parties, in most tyrannies, are actually umbrella organizations, big tents, that represent the pluralistic interests of numerous social and economic segments or strata. For many people, this approximation of democracy, the party as a big tent, is more than satisf a satisfactory solution to their need to be heard. And finally, how represented is the Vox Populi, even in established democracy, let's say the United States? In a democracy, people can freely protest and make their opinions known. That is true. Sometimes they can even change their representatives, though the rate of turnover in the United States Congress in the last three decades is lower than what it had been in, 20, in the last 20 years of the Politburo, just for your information. <clears throat> but is this, is this ability to change representatives, is this a sufficient incentive or deterrent? The members of the various elites in Western democracies are mobile. They ceaselessly and, and easily hop from one lucrative sinecure to another. Lost the elections as a, as a senator? How about a multi-million dollar book contract? A consultant position with a fir firm that you formerly oversaw or regulated? A lobbying uh, company, opening a lobbying company, or having your own talk show on television, or a cushy job in the administration. Being fired as the people's representative is hardly the end of one's career. Usually it's the beginning of another. The truth is that voters are powerless, even in established democracies. The rich and the mighty take care of their own. Malfeasance carries little risk and rarely any sanction. Western democracies are ossified bastions of self-perpetuating interest groups aided and abetted and legitimized by the ritualized spectacle that we call elections. And don't you think the denizens of Africa and Asia and Eastern Europe and the Middle East are blissfully unaware of this charade? They are aware, and that's why they opt not to be democratic. <laughs>